The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're coming to you live from the Warner Center in Woodland Hills, California. This is the home for Autism Live. It is also the home for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I'm really excited right now and have a stupid grin on my face because this is our first show of 2019 and it always feels like fresh beginnings, new, new start. Um, you know, it's just an opportunity to do things in a different way and look at things in a different way or, or to shake off some of the old and start with the new. Excited to be here with you. Uh, we have a brand new uh, producer who is working on the board today that we're so excited to welcome and we're going to be talking more about him in the coming days and give you an opportunity to meet him. Uh, but I'm excited about that and I'm excited about where we're headed. We've got a lot of things that we have going on today. I, um, normally we have asked Dr. Doreen and we will have Dr. Doreen next week. We do not have her today because she's got other pressing things and you know how that is, how that works. Uh, but in just a little while, we're gonna have Evelyn Kung with us for Ask Evelyn Kung. She's the clinical director here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders and she will be answering your questions in real time. But uh, in the meantime, and I, I see that uh, Traven has already started showing you some of the different ways that you can connect with us here at Autism Live. We have a brand new website. I know we've been promising that to you forever and ever and ever, but if you go to autism-live.com, you will see that it's a brand new setup. And we want you to click all the buttons and play with all the things that are there. Uh, you will notice that there are some different setups. We'd love your feedback. We'd love to know. We're not in beta anymore, but we'll still take feedback. We want to know what you guys think of the new site. If you get there and it really is kicking your keister and you just remember where all the old buttons were on the old site, you can still find the old site if you go to www.old autism-live.com, you should be able to find it. Uh, and you can still write in on the old feature, although we are not going to be attending to it as much. Now, on the new website, the, the new live feature is in a different place. So when the show is live, uh, there will be a button up at the, up at the upper left-hand corner that will say live, and you can click on that, and then the screen will pop up there. But in the bottom corner, whether you're on the live site or looking at the, the website, there is a chat button. And what I love about this is if you click the chat and you write in, um, it now dates it and times it for us so that I know when you ask the question. Uh, that still doesn't tell me what you were watching when you asked the question, but it gives me a little bit of a better idea of when you ask the question. So I really, really love that. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can write in and do that now. It's totally free. Um, and you can write in your questions to us at any time. There are lots of different ways for you to ask the question, uh, any question, or give us any comment. Traven just showed you a bunch of the different websites. But keep in mind, you can be watching us on YouTube, Facebook, uh, Twitter, on Periscope, and you can write in on any of those different formats. And it's free in all of those places. I loved that somebody came to me the other day and said, you know, you should consider doing a podcast. And I was like, we, that's what we do. <laughs> we call ourselves a web show because that's what we are. But we also podcast the show to a lot of different places too. You can get us on iTunes. It is a free download. Uh, we cover the cost of that for you to be able to download it for free. And you can choose if you want to download it as an audio file or as a video file. So if you want to be listening to us on your iPhone in the car as you're commuting, you know you can. Uh, so that's a really good thing. And we love to hear from you. Until a couple of years ago, uh, you know, when we do the whole show, um, we podcast the whole show. 
to different sites. It used to be that we, because you'll see on YouTube, we will have the whole show there and then we cut it up into highlights and the highlights are available on YouTube and only on YouTube. We stopped um, making the highlights available on iTunes and on Roku because it just it was taking up a lot of space and it just made it harder for you to find things. But if you write and tell us, oh, you know, I really want to see this class of videos uh, without doing the whole show, we'll, we'll happily cut them for you and put them on iTunes, but you need to request them. All right, uh, a couple of other things that I want to take a minute to talk about until uh, we're ready for uh, Evelyn Kong. Since it's the beginning of a new year, and uh, the new year for me always is bittersweet because we commemorate the anniversary of when my son was first diagnosed with autism. And I want to take just a second to talk about that because if you are someone who has tuned into Autism Live because there's a person in your life that you love that has not been yet been diagnosed, uh, especially our very little kids, and I don't mean to negate the adults who are going through the process of, of diagnosis, but it is different, right? It's vastly different. When you are an adult and you think that you have some of the symptoms and you're thinking about getting a diagnosis, it, it isn't as pressing um, because what's pressing at that point is that you just get the support that you need, right? And as an adult, you there are lots of things that are available to you, especially if you are able to read. There's so much information on the internet that you can go to and find. You don't actually have to get yourself a diagnosis. But if it's a child, um, there is a sense of urgency because there is funding for instance, for ABA, that it comes at a, a particular time in your life where you can get a lot of services if and only if you have a diagnosis. If you have a three-year-old who's not talking, you can't just show up and say, I'd like to do ABA and will someone pay for it? You've got to have the di diagnosis. So it's a very particular thing. Um, it took us, from the time that I, it took us six months before I realized I needed to make phone calls, right? And, and then it took me three days to find who do you call to get the diagnosis. And then that appointment wasn't for three and a half months. Then we had the diagnosis and then it took us another month before we could get any kind of service, but six months before we found good quality ABA. That all adds up and it wear and tear on your soul. And it's something you, I think that a lot of parents will tell you that we beat ourselves up about later on. How much time did we lose through all of that? And sometimes there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. So it's a useless beating yourself up, right? But I want to put it out there to anybody who's in that phase right now where you're just getting the diagnosis that um, I think that there are many difficult phases along the way. And I think that's the hardest one. When you don't yet know what you're looking at, you don't yet know what you can do. I used to say that the hardest thing was after the diagnosis until you could start services. But the truth of the matter is that uh, our friends at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders have made that time easier if you choose because on day one, you can all right now um, start helping that individual to learn more. You can go to www dot ibehavioraltraining.com and they've got videos there to train you in what to do and then you can go to skillsforautism.com and um, you can sign up for a free 14-day trial to to find out what to teach your child you take an assessment and it will give you a host of lessons and say these are appropriate for your child so you can do that right now and if you do the 14-day free trial, it won't cost you anything. The IBT, if you started with one module, it, they're around, they're somewhere between $7 and $20 a piece, and you can watch it over and over again. Um, to get, It's much less than buying a book, right? And uh, it's a video. Some of them are, I think the longest one is an hour and a half. And again, you get to watch it over and over again and learn from it. So if you were to do those two things today, you could really realistically start an intervention with your child in a very small way, but you could start today. Uh, you could start working on compliance today. Um, that's not unrealistic. And you wouldn't have to leave your home. You wouldn't have to take off your fuzzy slippers. So Skills for Autism, thank you for putting that up there. And the other one is ibehavioraltraining.com. 
So uh, waiting to get the diagnosis is sometimes, I think, the hardest thing. Um, but once you do get the diagnosis, you got to kick it into high gear. I'll be honest that if you didn't have a diagnosis yet and you're waiting to get the diagnosis, you could start with IBT, that eye behavioral training and skills. There's not a single thing in there that isn't appropriate for someone, whether they're on the spectrum or not. It's ju just good teaching techniques for an individual. So if you have a kiddo who's behind in speech and you're not sure whether you're going to get an autism diagnosis, there's nothing in IBT or skills that would hurt your child that would only help them. So uh, you know what? You don't even have to wait for the diagnosis, but you got to get it. You do have to get it, especially if you're dealing with somebody who's under the age of, I'd say, 25. Uh, because there is funding, there are services, and they're life-changing. So I put that out to you. I remember the rainy day here in L.A. when I took my child to the developmental pediatrician. And um, she spent, I don't know, like two hours with him. And at the end of it, she went to leave the room. And I said, where are you going? <laughs> like, I waited a long time for this. Come on back in here. Talk to me. What are we looking at? She had a very thick German accent. She was an older doctor. In fact, it was her first day of retirement that she was see My son was her first patient in her retirement. And she looked at me with her, and with her German accent, she said, yeah, autism. And let me just tell you, I, you know, it was like a ball that dropped through me. And uh, I always think of my life as being everything that happened before that exact moment and everything that has happened since. And I know that people get angry when, um, when an autism parent will say, I've, I've found the gifts in autism. But there are a lot of people that get really angry and go, really? really, uh, I'm not seeing the gifts, and it doesn't help me when you say that there are gifts. Uh, but I tell you that looking back uh, at, from where I am right now, if you had asked me this at any point in the first three years, I would have like yelled at you, right? But looking back now, my life is richer. The people that I have met, the relationship that I have with my husband and my son as a result of everything that happened is richer. I am a better person than I was on that day. And I don't have regrets. And that's a really important thing. I have no regrets. And I want you to have no regrets. And if you're new to the show, one of the things that I say all the time, I say, take my hand, come on, hold my hand, and we get through this together. You can't do this by yourself, right? You need a community of people around you who support you and understand what you're going through. And that's not usually the community of people that you had before you heard that A word, right? Your friends sometimes change. You find that, you know, they don't understand what you're looking at and what you're talking about. So you find new friends. Not that you have to get rid of those old friends, but you find new friends who get it. So I always say, hold hands. We get through this together. And si se puede. We can do this. We do this together as a community of people. You can do this. I know you can do this. You know why I know that you can do this? Because I did it. And if I could do it, oh my goodness. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If I could survive this and get through this, then I know for sure that you can. Just don't try to do it by yourself. Reach out. You can reach out to us and tell us what you need. Find yourself a good local support group and a good global support group that deals with whatever your particular brand of autism is in your house. This is not a one-size-fits-all. And, and we know now that there are at least seven different types of autism. And you're going to find that you make a friend, right? And you, so you got your, you know, your best friend in autism, but that your lives aren't exactly the same either. I remember when my son was in preschool, I met another mom and her son was added to my son's class and he had autism and I thought, oh my gosh. And I, I, I've got a new friend, I've got somebody who gets it. And in a lot of respects, we get each other's stuff. But our kids don't have the same kind of autism. And we weren't drawn to the same kinds of things. She was very into the biomedical and the chemistry of autism and the science of it and wanting to understand that. 
um, we're still very good friends and I call her my biomed mom. And I was much more into the diet and not the chemical uh, part of it, but I wanted to come up with recipes that tasted good that we could do with the diet. And of course, I got so excited about ABA and the science of behavior, not the chemical end. Please don't show me a peptide, uh, <laughs> a slide of a peptide of casein or gluten. I, I'm just like, I've seen enough of that in my life. Um, but I want to talk about the behavior and I got really jazzed about that. And we are still very good friends, my biomed mom and I, and our boys are still, when they, they don't get to see each other very much anymore, but they're still friends. And that's a wonderful thing. But to be honest, we all we both had to find our support group within our niche. I needed to be with other parents who understood what we were doing with our ABA uh, and and get really you know into talking about you know how does this work and so on and so forth. And she went to conferences to talk about the the immune system and the chemical and, and which supplements helped, right? But then we would connect in our lo local support group to talk about where do you go to get, what, who's got the best dentist in town that's good for autism? I really encourage you to make sure that you have that kind of support in your life, but please include us as part of your global support group. You can be writing into us on our, um, on our website, on our Facebook page, on our YouTube page, we are here. And we know what, at least in part, a piece of what you're going through, and I know how important it is. And I'm proud of you that you're doing this, and um, I'm proud that I get to be a part of it with you. It's such a privilege to be here with you guys. And I'm excited about 2019. We have some changes that are coming to the format of Autism Live that we hope will help more people access the information that we have. We want to utilize the library of videos that we have and help you to be able to find the answers that we've already, you we're going to keep on, of course. We're going to have more interviews with more people and try to give you more hope and inspiration and information. But we also want you to see what's already there. We've got a library of stuff. So if it's 3 o'clock in the morning and you're like, I don't know what to do, I don't know where to go, I don't know who to ask, that there is a library of videos that you can look up. What do I do about a tantrum um, on our website or on our YouTube page? And you're going to find a bunch of different videos. On our website, in fact, right now, um, at the top of the website, you'll see there's an icon that has the toy guide, right? But next to that, it has an Ask Dr. Doreen button. If you click on that, you get a choice of looking by video or looking by topic. And I got to tell you, we fought really hard for that topic thing, and we've got more of that coming. You're going to be able to search our Temple Grandin videos for topic as well eventually. But I hope that, take it for a spin. Click the by topic and look at all the topics. They're, they're separated um, by categories, and so, you know, you can look at potty training, right? And you click on the potty training, and you can go in the alphabet, so you don't have to scroll through all of them. Go to the P, go to potty training, and then see what pops up. And it'll populate a bunch of questions. So there'll be a question about, you know, how do you potty train a 15-year-old with autism? Well, maybe that's not what you want to know. Maybe you want to know, how do you potty train for a trip? And so you look down through the questions, and you find the one that's closest to yours. You click on it, and it takes you right to the space in the video where Dr. Grand Pichet answers that question. How much do we love that? I love that a lot. So uh, those are some of the things that we have for you guys. Those are the, some of the things that we're bringing. I um, know that this is going to be an exciting year. Uh, we're going to make some headway here. And we're especially going to be focusing on classroom. But uh, more than ever, I'm, I'm calling this the year of the parent. And we want to help you guys to be able to supercharge all of your programs and get through all of the issues that are preventing you from getting there. That's what we've got going on here. But we'll cover everything, absolutely everything. All right, you guys, uh, we're going to take a, a short break. And then we are going to come back with a segment that we call Ask Evelyn Kung. She's going to be here answering your questions. And you can ask those in real time on Facebook, YouTube, on any of the sites, including our website. So don't go away. We're going to be back after these messages.
Our twins, Justin and Jessica, were premature babies, so we always were very conscientious of their development. But I think it was probably 15 months, Justin started getting really obsessive compulsive with opening and closing doors. And Justin started tantruming a lot too. These would be major tantrums that were just completely debilitating to the family. Having to take them out of the house, put them in the car, drive around, just to calm them down. Yeah, I remember a breaking point and just thinking, you know what, we gotta do something, this is not right. Once we were on the track to getting a diagnosis for autism, we started sharing that with our close friends and family. It just so happens that somebody from our older daughter's private school called us out of the blue. She introduced herself and she says, I know that recovery is possible. Those words so early in our journey were a guiding force for us. As we got more educated in knowing what is effective therapies for kids with autism, we realized quality ABA is vital to that progress. That's where we decided that CARD was the right provider for us and for our son. Justin responded very well to therapy. The behaviors were tracked and we saw that what was being instituted was working. Justin, what are you doing? I'm coloring. You are coloring, good for you. There was real progress and it was progress that was tangible. I just remember when he he made a sentence, he said a sentence. We were just happy about it, going, no way, I can't believe you just did that. What's the date? The 18th. 18th of what month? December. Oh, what year is it? 2007. Oh, okay, so how old are you today then? The therapies that CARD did for Justin didn't just impact his daily living skills, but it was a positive impact on our entire family. I'm Justin. I am in fourth grade. I like playing video games sometimes. My dream to build a teleporter machine. Like sometimes if like we're on an airplane and it's like really long, you guys just say, oh, hurry up with that teleporter machine. I'm waiting on you. <laughs> and I just started Friday Night Lights. This is our third game of the season and um, it's pretty fun. You have to be fast. We attribute so much of Justin's recovery to CARD. Their goal was the same as our goal. We wanted Justin recovered. June 12, 2008 is a day that I celebrate every year because that is the day that Justin was deemed recovered from autism. And Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet met with us, looked at him and just said, he's brilliant. You need to keep his mind stimulated because he's very smart and he has no residual traits of autism. Welcome back to Autism Live uh, to this segment that we call Ask Evelyn Kung. Oh. I'm so thrilled to have you here. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And for those of you who don't know Evelyn, Evelyn has been here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders for how many years? Oh, you make me count every time. It's <laughs> more than 25 now, more definitely. More than 25 years. And she is such a wonderful resource uh, clinically, like I don't think there's a single thing that I wouldn't run to you with clinically. <laughs> you know what you. I mean? Well, because you've dealt with so many kiddos over so many years uh, with so many different issues. <laughs> So uh, it used to be that I used to just run to you with questions about teenagers, and I still am waiting for your book to come out because you have so many things for teenagers and adults that are so helpful and useful. Uh, but then I realized what a wonderful, you have such a, a great experience that really I could ask you anything from somebody who's one to 101. And I feel like you've already been there, done that, and seen that, and have such great knowledge. It's so. just fun for me. 
Well, see, you know? and that's the other thing that it's I love. That fun. That's the way you think of it. It's that it's like fun solving these issues and connecting people with the resources and the answers that they need to get to the good stuff. Yeah, it's it's. I always say that you know this is. I just love the problem solving aspect and all the people and the variety keeps yeah. me going. Yes. You know, well, I'm not I, a mundane person. <laughs> and can I can I just say though that what a gift that is to the autism community that you that you feel that way about it that yeah. that informs us of how we should feel instead of being like oh no we have these challenges, uh, you know that to know that an expert of your caliber is like let's get in there let's let's solve it yeah like let's it do can it be solved <laughs> yeah that's exactly. a really great gift to no, all of us. I so want everybody you. to know that there's always a way. I love it. It may take a little bit, but there's always a way. <laughs> I absolutely love that. So I'm going to jump in here with some questions okay. uh, that we already had. And I want to say hi to Mike Kippel, who wrote in to us on the live feature on the new website. Mike, I got it. Happy New Year. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, okay, so what is the difference between the skills living and the regular version? Is the content the same or different? And maybe we need to start because there might be people who don't know what skills is. Yes. So originally, probably more than 10 years ago um, now, we came up with skills which is based on developmental uh, levels. So we didn't go strictly by what development was showing about, you know, we knew a baby walked before they talked. But we looked at every single aspect to see like, you know, in programming and creating treatment plans, how do you um, teach something. So one of the earliest skills is joint attention, which is being able to show someone of interest with your eyes and with your head and, you know, and reading social cues is really difficult, but it comes at a really early age. Mm -hmm. But what we do is there's all these prerequisites. You have to be able to make eye contact, right. which is a deficit in, in um, ASD individuals. And then you have to be able to point and you have to be able to do all these skills. So that we had to teach all those skills first before you could actually teach joint attention. So a lot of skills, um, the basic curriculum, is based on development. And we looked at um, a lot of standardized testing, looking at de developmental criteria. When does uh, a certain skill come in the ASD community? Is this true or not true? Are there prerequisites? So that's how the original curriculum was built for skills. When um, skills living, which is what actually people outside of CARD use, and if you're a CARD internal person, it's skills for life. Okay. Um, that was a whole other issue, oh, <laughs> the naming. But we, okay. we wanted a different, you know, CARD people want what they want. Okay. And, you know, so that, you know, that's what the name is for internally. But we, there are all these teenagers and adults coming in now, yeah. and there are all these skills that just needed to be taught. And the kids that, or the kids, or the individuals that come in in teen years, mm -hmm. they tend to really, um, their needs are completely different. Yeah. So it could be they've never had any intervention, therefore we're just starting out with functional language. Or it could be that they finished high school, but they have no friends, no job, no skills whatsoever, and we need to find something for them. And so um, as in skills, regular skills, um, there's eight curricula. And it really is focused on development. In skills living or skills for life, we had to prepare for what are all the things that a teen or an adult would need to live independently. Mm -hmm. And so the curriculum area, there's 16 curriculum areas. That's a lot. And anything that was in the basic skills that we thought, OK, it's still relevant, we did pull a lot of those activities into skills for, skills for life. Okay. But there are all these other skills now, too, that are needed, such as independent living and yeah. personal responsibility and vocation and all these other skills that are needed for these adults that aren't relevant to somebody below the age of 10. Right. <laughs> like how to balance a checkbook. Yeah. Like why? Well, there's adults who would say they don't need that now. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, yes, there is that. But I mean, that kind of, an 8-year-old, 10-year-old is not going to do that. But knowing how to manage your money, let's say that, not yeah. balancing a checkbook, um, you're not trying to accomplish that at eight or ten usually. Yeah, That's or it, and accessing your community, you know, at an eight or ten year old, you're hopefully still going to the library with your parents. Mm -hmm. You're not the one trying to get yourself a library card, although right. there are some kids that, who are independently doing that. Right. But it's not a skill that should be learned or would be helpful. Um, somebody hopefully is still guarding, watching yes. them, parenting them. But for an adult, we had the other day, he had no clue like how, how to even fill out his insurance form. Yeah. He was coming into card. And we had to had to sit there and say one of the goals that we have for him that he would know his own health information. Yes. You know, so he would yes. be able to fill out his insurance card and what are my allergies? Do I have any preferences? You know, what injuries I've had when they happened? Yes. 
So what we're finding with a lot of the adults coming is that's the basic part first because they have to get into card. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so we're helping them do these things that are really basic skills that an adult would do. And they will be able to take that access, that information and be able to, you know, use it hopefully for the rest of their life. So on a basic level, skills living is the, the teen adult mm -hmm. curriculum. Yes. And it's very sp individual specific. Yes. Where um, skills, the regular skills, mm -hmm. the skills for autism, is the developmental thing for everybody from birth through age eight, Probably 10, eight to, 11. Eight to 10, 11, yeah. Yeah, um, somewhere in there. And, and it's still pretty individualized because mm -hmm. they take an assessment and it's individualized. But the truth of the matter is, is that three-year-olds on the spectrum tend to need things that well, are just similar play. to other three-year-olds. Just like if, if, I'm, if I'm looking at a kid, I'm going to say, do you play? Yeah. You need to learn how to play. But when you're coming in at 15 or 20 or 30, I'm not asking if you're playing anymore. Right. I'm asking actually the more appropriate is what do you do in your free time? Yes. What is your leisure time spent doing? I'm not going to go back and teach you imaginative play because adults don't really do that anymore. Yeah. I'm going to come back and say like, hey, where do you uh, hang out with peers? Where do you, you know, do you have things that you do in your free time when you're alone right. that's productive? It's targeted toward their specific needs. And it's giving them the respect. Yes, there's you that know, too. It's giving adults the respect and the teens, the older teens, the respect that, you know, there's all these things they didn't do, but there are still all these things they could do. Yes. And yes. that's important. Absolutely. You know, we want to give them respectfully according to their age. Yeah. What are they actually doing? What music are they listening to? Can they other find other peers that are similar ages being able to do the same things? You know, accessing their community, really. Yeah. It's giving them skills where they can go out in the community and find people. And they don't need a lot of people, yeah. you know, but they need someone to be able to share it with. Absolutely. So now one of the questions that we do get about skills living on a regular basis, though, is is it just for people who are very impacted or is it just for people who are high functioning? Who's it for? Well, that's why there's 16 curriculum areas, mm -hmm. is because we're hitting the whole range. Okay. Because when they come in, we don't know what they have. Unfortunately, we still do get 20 year olds who have no means of communication, Right. you know, functional communication. Therefore, we have a functional communication curriculum. And a lot of those activities in that curriculum, you can see in development in the basic skills because everybody needs functional communication yes. or adaptive skills in the same way everybody needs to know how to use a utensil to eat um, you know be able to brush their teeth and those are things that we're working on you know below age five um, hopefully but if they come in at 20 and they still don't have those skills we're gonna go back yeah. and reach into those areas and one thing about like um, for skills for living that's really different is in skills the basic skills we ask you to do the whole assessment because we just want to know where the holes are and how they impact each, one, each other. But in Skills for Life or Skills Living, the person comes in saying, this is what I want to work on. Yeah. And they can pick and choose which areas that they yeah. want to work on. They don't have to do the assessment for the all 16 curriculum. Right. <laughs> they just do what they want to work on at that time. And in fact, in all probability, um, no one would would probably need all of the things yes. in Skills for Living. You might you know, just focus on one part of it and ignore the rest of mm -hmm. it, and another person would focus on this part of it, ignoring that part. Yes. It really is that tailored. You don't need the whole thing. You don't need the whole thing. And a lot of it, you, you'll, so you'll see some cross-referencing, but for the most part, it depends on what your need is in an adult. You know, as a teen and an adult, what do you need? What do you want to work on? And a lot of times we get the independent adults who come in and say, this is what I want to work on. Yeah. Sometimes we'll get the um, teens or adults who come in and they have a caregiver saying, this is what we need to work on. Yes. And sometimes we get the teens who say, yeah, I want to do this, but I really don't want to do other things. And then you have to talk them into doing the right. prerequisites. Right. <laughs> you know? Well, and to be fair, you know, if you don't know, I, I, there's one person that I really respect and admire on the autism spectrum who's an adult who for years was writing into us and saying, but I don't want friends. Yes. I don't want friends. I don't want to know about having friends. I'm not interested in having friends. I don't want lessons about that. Don't talk to me about having friends. And my position was uh, always to him, uh, you know, I hear what you're saying, but until you know what it's like to have a friend, I'm not sure if you know what you're saying no to. Mm -hmm. And then he got a friend. Oh. 
And he said, okay, I get it now. I, and I'm glad that people kept pushing me to have a friend because now I see how wonderful that is. And you're right. I didn't know what it would be like to have a friend. Well, and there's the other range where I've had, you know, adults tell me, yeah, I don't want a friend or a kid want friends. I said, well, what do you really want to do though? What are, you know, what are those goals? And so many of their goals involved where they had to interact with people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And okay, if you want to do this, you have to be able to go out and, you know, speak appropriately, have that social interaction. Yes, you're not looking for a friend, but you're doing this for all these other goals. And then in that process, they realize, I kind of like social interaction. Yeah. I kind of like people. And it surprises them, you yeah. know, in that process. And that in itself is a huge, you know, a huge learning, um, a learning situation where it wasn't their goal, but they found something in the process that benefited them. Okay. They really loved. Love so. that. So. All right, we're going to take a short break and come back with more questions. Before we go to break, though, I want to address uh, a parent wrote in and said, is there a place to get uh, funding for tracking grants? Uh, that they've already applied for a grant to ACT, um, which formerly ACT today, um, and that there haven't been enough funds. And I, and I know that continues to be a problem, um, that it, unless they make enough money, they can't fulfill even half of the grants that they get requests. And a tracking device is a really important thing. Um, I'm not aware of anybody else besides ACT today that really works for a tracking device. However, the reason why is because a lot more insurances are covering it and sometimes your state has a mandate. The state of New York has a mandate. If you're in the state of New York, you can, you can get a tracking device. Um, they, ha they have to pay for it. But a lot of states now, your insurance will pay for it. So I would immediately pick up the phone, um, call your insurance provider and ask them what they need. Just don't even say, do you fund this? What do you need from me? Do you need a doctor's excuse? What do you need to have for my child to have a tracking device? It's a matter of life and death. And then if they, if they say, oh, nope, I've looked it up and it's not covered, then write me back and we'll try another venue. Can yes? I add yeah. something to that? Yeah. So I know you're, at least two or three years ago, I haven't heard it recently, but I know some of the health insurance companies have a nonprofit division. Ah. So I know like United Healthcare actually Absolutely. had a grant pool yeah. that they would take applications for for these kinds of things. Great point. There, I because so. I always love to tell people United Healthcare Children's Fund. Mm -hmm. um, you can apply for a grant of up to five thousand yeah. dollars. But if your insurance will pay for yes. it first, do that and apply for the United Healthcare grant for your copay and other stuff yep. that you need. But another. But thank you for thinking of that because that is another venue. Uh, okay, but get that tracking device. Do do what you have yes. to do, so that, and and write me back or call me back if you have no luck because we want to make sure you get one. It is a matter of life and death. Uh, but when we come back, we're going to answer a question who came in from our we we have names for some of our uh, viewers that so our West Virginia mom has written in a question, Aww. and we're taking that next. So stick with us. Logan Shepard. At first glance, he looks like a typical American teenager. He plays in a band, loves hanging out with his friends, he doesn't like doing homework, and he's not really fond of broccoli. But Logan Shepard is not your typical 14-year-old. Logan was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. He was nonverbal, made no eye contact, and his parents were told to abandon all hope. Instead, his parents began an intensive intervention treatment. At its center was a quality ABA program known as the CARD method. This is Logan Shepard now. All I really want to say is like, I'm kind of copying Martin Luther King. I kind of have a dream like that one day, like I can just like inspire people and never give up. Cause like, that's what I want to do in life. Cause if I can succeed, they can succeed and I will succeed. To follow Logan's musical journey, visit www.facebook.com slash official drummer rock or at drummer rock on Instagram. For more information on the card method, visit www.centerforautism.com or call 800-345-CARD. Rock on, Logan.
We just love Logan Shepard. Can I just say, too, by yeah. the way, we all love Logan yes. Shepard. Logan Shepard was my shepherd to come to CARD. Yes. He was the kid that I met, that I went, I want to do what those people are doing, because he was so awesome and continues to be so awesome. Yes. Awesome. That was him at 14, you guys, and he's 17 now and oh. touring and uh, has, you know, fans chasing him down the street. And I, I just, and he is mo it. one of the most remarkable people <laughs> on the planet. Anyway, having said that, uh, I promised we were going to get to our West Virginia mom. She says, hey, Shannon, West Virginia mom here. I had previously talked about my daughter repeating herself after every sentence. We very recently went to the doctor because she has also started screaming randomly, and it seems involuntary. Now we're being told it's likely Tourette's. Oh, wow. and need to see a neurology because she could have been misdiagnosed with high-functioning autism instead of Tourette's because Tourette's mimics autism if there are no tics developed yet. And she's got two question marks there. I have never in my life heard this and want some insight as to whether or not Tourette's and autism are that closely related that I missed it. I feel like a failure, honestly, because I wasn't hearing my daughter properly when she said my brain won't let me stop I'm a robot. I didn't understand she literally meant it was involuntary. I'm being told that Tourette's also encompasses sensory processing, social pragmatic language, and, inhibits ish and inhibition issues. Is all of this true? And thanks and much love to you all. And much love to you back. I clearly don't know. Um, how much do you know about Tourette's, Evelyn? And help us out. Save us. You know, I love, I love Ili Eliana Vincent when she does this and she says, you know, save yourself. So Oh, Evelyn, save us. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I have experienced the Tourette's, okay. um, both actually internally with our kids as well as my one of my best friends has okay. three kids with Tourette's. There we go. And it's interesting how they do cross over. Don't beat yourself up that it's one versus the other because either way, both can learn through ABA. There we go. You know? Yeah. I, I mean, I, ABA can teach anybody, I think, um, any skill if you really, you know, target it. But for the most part, if, you know, your kids are still young, ABA only helped them, okay? With Tourette's, it's interesting in the sense that there is a lot of involuntary um, shrieks and tics and different things. And it happens a lot of times with most of the kids I know when um, anxiety, oh. anxiety actually increases. So when the kids are a little bit more stressed, they actually, their tics actually increase more. Okay. Um, so a lot of what you're teaching a Tourette's uh, child is coping skills mm -hmm. and teaching them how to calm themselves because when they do calm themselves and they're able to recognize okay this is what's going on you see a lot of their um, outside um, non-inhibitory type of behavior actually it starts you, you can't inhibit it okay it actually a lot of times comes down I have to say with Tourette's kids I medication is actually a really great place to start getting a really good neurologist that specializes in pediatrics and Tourette's mm -hmm. the thing is aut with autism and Tourette's there is a wide range on both ends it is the spectrum I yeah. feel like because I have Tourette's kids who just there's a little bit of ticks and you can't tell a lot and then I have my ones that come in and they're you know it's constant ticks they okay. just try initially it's just like trying to um, get some control on that one thing that is similar with a lot of the kids that are on both is they're very concrete thinkers and so you know in the autism world we always say you know they're really black and white thinkers they don't see the gray I see that in the Tourette's kids a lot okay I see that same similarity. They get, the Tourette's kids, when they're actually focused, get more of the hints of what's going on around them. They can read social cues better. Um, a lot of times, though, if they're taking a lot, they don't focus and their attention ah. isn't on that. Well, that so if makes you, sense. Yeah, so like um, I had a 13-year-old who's getting bullied, mm -hmm. a Tourette's kid, and um, he was saying somebody else was bullying him, and it turned out it was another ASD kid, but he never... He didn't know to tell his mom mm. that the kid had ASD, even though he knew. Okay. And so the mom saying, this kid's like in my face, da, da, da. da. And then I just happened to go pick him up with the mom. Uh -huh. And I saw him, and immediately from far away, I knew like, right. oh, this is a spectrum kid. Right. So immediately I asked him, I said, is this, does this kid have autism? And he's like, yes. And I said, do you know what autism is? And he actually could tell me what autism was. Right. But I was like, okay, let's talk about it in terms of you. Right. And how this child interacts with you. And, and then he was like, oh. And then he knew, like, right. okay, I need to be a little bit more compassionate. He doesn't understand. And then it's, it kind of like put the bullying into like a different court. 
yeah. and because he just he just wasn't reading it enough even though he knew this information about this other kid yeah. he didn't put it in context but when I actually would focus him yeah he was like okay I know what to do now like okay. you know and it's really interesting so they get they don't have that probably the social deficit when and it sounds like there's a that they have the perspective taking piece that a lot of times our kids don't yes, have. Yes, they definitely have perspective taking, but you have to stop them to actually think about the perspective. Taking. Okay. So a lot of and, and it's the same. Well, thing that's with a lot. that's adults. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the ADHD kids too. A lot yeah. of ADHD kids are like so impulsive and going, and they never stop to read the cue that the other peer is really annoyed by what they're doing. Yeah. And once they you stop them, they're like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I think that's neurotypical adults in this society. When I see, like, I get, the thing that makes me the most frustrated now in life is that I go, you know, we spend a lot of time teaching my son who's on the spectrum perspective taking, and I'm frequently standing there talking to somebody who's an adult who doesn't have a disability, like, you know, no disability. Like, I leave room for the fact that maybe there's one that I can't see, but then you ask them and they go, no, I don't identify as being disabled. <laughs> and, and they're not taking anybody else's perspective. Yeah. I think that's rampant in the world. Yeah, so with the, with, ter, with Tourette's, I would say definitely go to the neurologist. Okay. Go do a whole full evaluation because medication actually has helped all the Tourette's kids I've worked with yeah. a lot. Okay. And just controlling the tics so that they have time to pay attention to what's going on around them. Interesting. A lot of um, kids with Tourette's, because they have the perspective taking, they actually are really embarrassed by all their tics. Oh. And that, ha that it creates the social avoidance. Right. And it looks like maybe they don't understand, right. you know, that social piece. But a lot of it is they're very, uh, you know, they, because they have that perspective taking. Yes. Um, and they know, like, I look weird or so-and-so is making fun of me or whatever it yes. is. They, they know that it's not right. They don't know exactly what it is. So a lot of times I'd say seek the, you know, the, medi uh, the medical f field. Go okay. look and talk to a doctor because medication actually helps so much of the Tourette's things. And then after that, you can see, like, what deficits are still there and not there. You know, in my world, when people come in, they need an ASD t um, diagnosis to get insurance funding. Right. But really, I tell the families, I actually don't really care about the diagnosis that much. I want to look at the child, what are they doing, what can't they do, and I'm going to address the deficits as they yes. come, because overall it is improving quality of life. Exactly. You know, in whatever form. Now I have a really probably not very intelligent question, but can you have autism and Tourette's? Well, I, I'm guessing probably, like in the new diagnosis of autism, Yeah. Um, it leaves room for the genetic, okay. the specifier saying if it does come from um, a genetic disorder or some other disorder. So like when I started this 20 years ago, RETS, which is another disorder, and right. it was a pervasive development disorder, nobody knew anything about it, so I'd get RETS kids who also had autism. Yeah. But now they know the genetics behind it. So now you could get ASD with a, a specifier that it's a genetic, you know, RETS diagnosis. So there's a lot of changes. And, and for funding, you know, that's usually the purposes of the diagnoses overall. But in terms of what you're teaching, it's all the same. Okay. And for everybody watching, if you have a child with a Tourette's diagnosis, can that qualify you for ABA through your funding source? I don't think there is any funding for it right now for, for ABA. That's I don't know. You on. need to look at it. But yeah, for those people, those families with Tourette's, you yeah. know, this is something to go into the community and say, hey, we need this help. We're seeing more and more families getting. ABA services with an ADHD mm -hmm. uh, diagnosis. And that's just in the last two years. There yeah. was actually the article, research article that came out that said medication and um, ABA had the same effect mm -hmm. on the ADHD kid. Love so, that. And, and that. And you don't have the side effects the of the medicine uh, when you're doing, okay. And the thing is, I want to say, like, I always say, let's do the behavioral first before the medication. But there are some diagnoses that the medication yes. just helps a lot. Yes. And the thing is, um, there are families who don't want to try any medication. And actually, I would probably be in that camp. But what I've learned over the years is that, you know, if medication could help just to take the edge off. Yes. Don't be afraid to try it because d just because you're doing using the medication now doesn't mean they're going to be on it forever. Right. You know? Absolutely. It just doesn't require. So don't rule one way or another out. Talk to your medical professional. But I love that you're already at the neurologist and mm -hmm. 
That's the place to be We're first. Sending you a hug. Sending you a hug. Okay, I'm going to move on to another question here. Hi, ladies. Thank you for your uplifting show. My five year old is having a hard time with his pronouns, <laughs> mainly the I, me, and my pronouns. When I refer to myself, I use the correct pronoun. I recently heard the BA refer to herself in the third person. Should I change my style? Is it better? Is a better way to do it? Any other tips are appreciated. This is a hard thing, the pronoun thing. Yeah, pronouns are, are kind of funny to me because initially when I remember coming into this field, that was one of the markers mm, is that yeah. they used inappropriate pronouns and it's the I and you and me um, part. They can use all the other ones yeah. because they're very clear and distinct. Yeah. But um, So your behavior analyst, I'm going to take a guess. I don't know what she was doing there. But one of the procedures in teaching a child to use the correct pronoun is um, a shaping and fading method. Okay. So if I was talking to you and I was teaching you how to use I, I would say, I, Evelyn, would like for you, Shannon, to blah, 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 blah. Okay. And then I would slowly fade out the third person name so that the kids start to figure out that I'm pairing them so that they're similar and I'm showing them it's similar. Right. In w and where they're used. And that is a technique that a lot of behavior analysts use where they okay. pair the third person with the correct um, person pronoun. Okay. So I would say, I, I, Evelyn, would like you to blah, 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 you know? Right. Or you, Shannon, would do da, 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 whatever the instruction is, and then I would slowly take away your name, fade out okay. your name, fade out my name. Right. But just very methodically. So it's not, you know, whether it's bad or not. But pronouns is one of those things where I always tell supervisors or uh -huh. BCBAs, it's one of those things you work on early, and it just kind of lingers over many years. Because I think you really do have to teach the kids how to use it, and then they have to fluently, they have yeah. to build it into their repertoire. Yeah. So I could have started pronouns on year one of ABA, and in year four still be doing some pronoun okay. work, because I think initially they're trying to figure out what it is. Right. Like what are these pronouns? And then at a certain point, they, they can self-correct. Right. And then at a certain point, they start making the changeover. Okay. And the fluency aspect of it. So kind of like when you're working on a sound um, that, because I know people go, oh, well, if you're going to work on it for four years, that sometimes feels frustrating and like we won't work on it. But, you know, I know there are certain sounds that kids have a difficulty making, you know, like a TH sound. But, so we start working on it at knowing that it's not going to change overnight, mm -hmm. uh, that we're in it for the long haul, but that is not a reason to. To, to just say, well, we're not going to work on it. Yeah, and, and the thing is, it's not like it's, it's central to a program for four years. Right. It's you know, running in the background. It's running in the background. It starts out very central as a specific lesson, and then it slowly goes to the generalization phase, and that generalization phase is probably where it takes the longest. Okay. And then building it into the fluency aspect, meaning in, um, in time, time matters. How fast am I talking that I'm able to make that switch on that pronoun? Okay. So keep that in mind. Patience, mm -hmm. patience, patience. patience. I don't expect it to be overnight. I want to skip to a question. Hi, how many hours a week should my BCBA be training the behavioral assistant a week when they first start and for how long? Oh, that's Love a big question. Yeah. That's a really big one. It, it depends. I can't give you a specific um, response to that one. Um, you know, there is the theoretical knowledge aspect where... You know, there's a lot of online e-learning um, programs like through the Institute of Behavioral Training, mm -hmm. right? There is a module where we can give it to the behavior therapist and say, okay, that we're training you, here's the background, and you're not spending the one-on-one -on -one time with the kid. You're just right. learning, like, what is a discrete right. trial, what is a behavior, what is a function. You're, you're really yeah. learning basics. So there's that aspect where you could give that training um, in another method where you're not utilize, you don't need the BCBA there. Yeah. And um, parents can buy it and have their person train. And then there's the other aspect of the practicum and learning where it is someone with experience is with a child and the behavior, anal um, the behavior technician and being able to prompt them and show them how to do it in that practical time. Yeah. It ranges quite a bit. I used to do a lot of training in um, our expansion or work what we used to call workshops. When there wasn't an office nearby, I would fly, and I would spend two to three days, and they would be full days. They'd be yeah. six to eight hours where I'm with the, um, the people that the family have hired, and I'm going to train them all to, to um, do actual behavioral techniques as well as teach them what my programming is, what my yeah. treatment plan is for their child. And in two or three days, maybe it'd be 18 to 20 hours, I could get them to a place where I could guide them by phone. 
yeah. or video. Yeah. Uh, but it really, it depends. some people pick it up faster, some people pick it up slower. But it really is letting your, you know, your behavior analyst should have a checklist of things that this person needs to learn. Yeah. And being able to go through it and giving them feedback in real time and saying like, are you, have you mastered the skill? Yes, you have mastered it. Let's go to the next target. You're doing, you know, how, you know, how are you implementing this area? And being able to go through. So there is the, there's the basic learning um, what ABA is and implementing it. And then there's learning the treatment plan for your child. Yes. That could be a whole different piece. Yeah. And then if, um, if that person is working with more than one child, so kids on the spectrum can be totally different. Yeah. So the treatment plans can be different. Even um, the methodology could be different. It's all ABA, but under ABA, ABA is the umbrella, and then yeah. there's just different ways. There's the discrete trial therapy, there's natural environment training, there's pivotal response. There's just all these, and you choose what is appropriate to the child that you're working with. And so there, it could be specific training that has to go for that be, um, the behavior technician. And just because the parent is asking this, it leads me to think that there's a bigger question here. Okay. Like, you know, either the parent is, to me, this is what I read into it, that either the parent is saying, I think they're spending too much time on training and not actually doing therapy, or I hear from a lot, I hear every day from parents, I don't want somebody working with my child that isn't trained. And my thing that, you know, I, I want to hug every parent who says that to me because I was one of those people. I was like, my child is not a Petri dish. They are not your guinea pig. I want the, the trained person. Give me the trained person. And now I make parents angry because I say, I know. I know. I thought that. I felt that too. And you do want to have somebody on your team that is, you know, a rock star and mm -hmm. has been there and done that and seen that and has that kind of assurance. But what I learned 2020 hindsight was that all of the newer therapists and, and I'm talking about card therapists, which means that they went through an extensive training yes. before they ever got to my kid, but they were still new. Um, that those are the therapists who ensured that we got where we wanted to go. Because as somebody explained to me, you're not trying to get your child to be able to interact with the best, most trained ABA professional exactly. in the world. You're trying to get them to be able to interact with the world. Yes. And those people don't know anything about ABA. Yes. And why not have them be with somebody who has a strong basic in ABA but maybe doesn't know your kid and, and hasn't had all that many hours of experience because they're the gateway to ensure that your child generalizes and to ensure that your child is ready for the world and the world is ready for your child. I am humbled now when I see my child interact with new people um, and have no problem whatsoever doing it, no matter what their accent is, no matter how what their cadence is, how they... What they look like. What they look like, <laughs> what, you know, how they present. My child does much better than my husband or I in interacting with people. Sometimes I'm like, what did he say? And my son is like, what, what is wrong with you? He said this, you know, and I'm like, I don't, I'm not, I like my hearing. I, you know, but I couldn't hear the accent and I couldn't decode and whatever. But my son can, um, and he knows how to repair the conversation when he can't. Um, because he had the right curriculum and because he didn't have people who always were like the best, highest, you know, as a parent, that's what you want. You think you want, give me the most trained ABA. I would like you, <laughs> I would like for you, only you to come and work with my child, but, and you would be brilliant. But having those other people really adds depth to the program and helps your child to generalize. Yeah, that generalization piece. And also, you know, it's one of the reasons we have a team of people. You know, the child needs to know in a quick way that whether you are telling me this, you or you or you, it all means the same thing. Right. It might see, it, the words could be similar or, or very different or the way you look, the sound knowing that, hey, you know what, I want every, this child to know that no matter what those issues are, it doesn't matter, the, you know, the words I hear still mean this, right? you know, or the facial expressions. And I'm this. expected to respond in a certain way, you know, to at least acknowledge that you asked and, me something. And it has a meaning. Yes. You know, there's meaning behind anybody that has interaction that's directed at me. Yeah. And I wish that there was a way that we could 
you know, I say it from time to time on the show, and I think parents go, oh, I hadn't thought of it that way, because I didn't. I didn't think of it that way. Um, but I, I wish we could quiet parents' fears. They're always afraid that they're getting a new therapist who doesn't know what they're doing. And I, and I, they come to me and run to me to, for, because they know I'm going to take their side and go, mm -hmm. yes, no, I felt that way too. But then I tell them the other side and I go, but that's not helping you. You're actually getting in the way of your child getting better. Mm -hmm. And then nobody likes me, but, uh, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, you know, but anyway, uh, we are out of time. How did that go that fast? It goes so fast. But I want to thank you so much for everything that you do, and thank you for coming in and oh, doing this welcome. for us. It's Always great. such a pleasure having you be no, here. No, it's wonderful being here. All right, we're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back with Nancy Allspaugh Jackson for Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. We have two amazing guests that are going to be with us, um, so stick around. We've got a big show for you, plus in the news. We'll be right back. And you say hi, and we say hi. Let's get right. Hi, welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Lisa Ackerman. I've got Kristen Selby Gonzalez here with me today. And the feedback, overwhelmingly. Oh, chicken nuggets! It's probably one of the easiest recipes on the planet. Uh, we know all of our kids love <laughs> chicken nuggets. Oh, let's talk about corn, GMOs, uh, genetically modified foods are no bueno for a lot of folks, and we agree. So um, I've actually called the manufacturers to make sure these are GMO-free product. Really simply what I did with the, um, the cornflakes is just the old-fashioned crush away. Um, that's just the easiest way. Maybe you can crush that a little well, bit for me. That's something our kids can help us with. Yeah. We're doing cooking with them. Well, and fine motor yeah, improvement. Absolutely. Boom. The sensory <laughs> issues. Boom. A lot of people will over season. Uh, they season for adults. So, from the standpoint of just putting it in enough flavor, now that we got our uh, base, our coating in, I'm going to work on how we coat the chicken. Now, Kristen, uh, was Jax ever allergic to eggs? He has been. There's a lot of options with eggs. Don't you know that you can also look at duck eggs? Really? Quail eggs and other types of eggs that even though they look the same in the bowl, they're different on the allergy panel. Let's say you find out you're allergic to every egg on the planet. You can use a little bit of water and arrowroot starch. I've got a, a high-grade stainless steel, non-Teflon frying pan. I'm using high heat oil, getting all ready to go. So we're just really easily going in and coating the chicken. Now, when I'm flipping these, Lisa, um, do I flip over and over, or do I just cook one side and then the other? You know, I prefer to cook one side, because what happens is the good coating that you spent all this time crushing oh. for me falls off. Gotcha. Bonus. About how long um, do you cook on each side? About four minutes on each side okay. will do it. And okay. I think you're almost there. Yeah, you're good. That you're golden. Good. Fantastic. So if you want to take sure. them out. So now that we got the last batch in, let me take you through what these finished babies look like. Like I said, you're going to have some happy families um, out there wanting to eat this. This is so easy. You saw how quickly we got in and done. Just want to remind everyone, we really want feedback at Autism Live and want to know what you want to see next. So if you've got an idea, a recipe you want us to convert um, or to talk about a particular topic, we'd love to hear from you. You can do that at autismlive at gmail.com or Facebook land. We're all on Facebook, facebook.com slash autismlive. And then again, there's already thousands of recipes waiting for your eyeballs to go cruise over on the TACA website. We'll look forward to seeing you next time on Autism Live. Thanks for joining us. Hello, fellow activists. Last week, we talked about the first step to empowerment, accept and embrace this challenge. Sometimes you have people that support you in your denial. Maybe it's your husband, maybe it's your mother. When I expressed my concern to my pediatrician about Wyatt losing language around the age of two, his response, maybe he's a late talker, he's a boy. Let's wait and see. <laughs> But what about the temper tantrums? What about the fact that he put his head through the kitchen window? What about the bite marks and scratches all over my arms and chest? He said he's probably just frustrated that he can't express himself. Let's wait and see. 
but autism doesn't afford us that luxury. Of course, I was relieved of my pediatrician's reassurances, but I should have gone with my gut, because if I had, I could have gotten a diagnosis two years earlier, and I lost two valuable years that could have been spent on early intervention. And finally, when Wyatt was diagnosed, he was misdiagnosed, but of course, part of that was my problem too. I lied in a lot of those parent questionnaires so things looked better. I can't turn back the hands of time, but I can recommend that you face this challenge head on. Denial prevents us from walking a path we eventually will have to walk anyway. The sooner you face the truth, the sooner you can help your child. Until next time, take care of yourself and keep the faith. Here we are. Welcome to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. I'm Nancy Allspaw Jackson. I'm Shannon Penrod and thrilled to be here. Yes. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. This is our first show back and right. we're really excited to be, I said to Nancy, I feel like it's been a month, but it kind of has been a month. Yeah. Um, but thrilled to be back here with you. Lots of things to talk about. I wanted to address just a quick question that came in and I'm going to get caught okay. up on the questions. Uh, but Faith wants to know, how can people with autism like me get independent living skills like cooking, cleaning, and et cetera? And I just want to say um, that there are more and more places that offer those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But you yourself right now can go on, we were just talking with Ev Kong about skills living. And we sometimes show a commercial for it. It's a new curriculum, relatively new, less than a year old out, that has those 16 curricular areas. And it includes things like cooking. So it will give you lessons that you can work on for yourself okay. um, to teach yourself. But there are all kinds of videos on YouTube mm -hmm. um, for those kinds of things. And um, CARD has a new center, the ACE Center in Duarte, California, that is specifically for teens and adults. Mm -hmm. and they have a mock um, dorm room oh. in um, the the place. They have a laundry room. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a kitchen that's totally functional, and they work on all of those lessons that are in skills living with you. Now, if you don't live in Duarte, you might think to yourself, well, okay, you know, <laughs> that's great that it's in Duarte. Right, right. Um, but they're looking at bringing more of those centers, more places, and okay. a lot of times... You know, they're, they're not the only place of that nature, so it's important to look and see what resources are available yeah. to see if there already is an adult program that does something like that in your area. Um, they may not specify that they deal with autism, but a lot of times what our adults with autism find is, uh, for instance, my dad had a stroke when he was 50 years old, mm -hmm. and then he needed rehab skills to be able to relearn a bunch of things that he didn't know how to do. So sometimes you'll find a rehab place for things like stroke that will have places to teach you cooking and cleaning, and they will, they will take funding for a person who's on the autism spectrum. Okay. And if they if you can't find one of those things, if you have a, a card center that's close, you can ask them for services, even if they don't have a center that is specific for adults and teens, they can teach these things to you. There's a bunch of videos online, um, IBT has, that. Um, are actual adults on the spectrum that were hired to do, they were hired as actors, but they are adults on the spectrum and they take them through the lessons so you can watch those as well. So that's a bunch of different resources as a possibility. Right. But if none of those work, please write back and let us know and we'll look more. And tell us where you live so that we can look right. to see where where you are. Okay, okay so there's so, that. Yeah. So we've got some stories in the news. Yes, we do have some in the news here. Um, One on autism and depression, and the gold standard for uh, depression is cognitive behavior therapy. But they've done. They've decided that that may not always work with those that have autism. Yes, and so this article comes to us from Spectrum News, and um, and I want to just say though that. As somebody who has been through cognitive behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. here's one of the problems I see. is Because and, and I recommend it here all the time, for especially for our teens uh, when you're dealing with anxiety, is that 
Um, a lot of cogn cognitive behavioral therapy is about self-talk. Mm -hmm. It's how you talk to yourself and what you say to yourself when you're feeling anxious. Okay. So, for instance, let's say that you're someplace and you start having anxiety like you're on the verge of a panic attack. Cognitive behavioral therapy would start you talking to yourself saying, what's happening right now? Right. Well, I'm not breathing as, you know, deeply. Uh -huh. And so can, do I have control over that? Yes, I do. And then what can I do? I can start breathing slowly and inhale. And, and you, you know, maybe the thought comes up, I think I'm having a heart attack, right? right? Which right. is what a lot of people say when they're right. having a panic attack. And they get even more stress. Right. And cognitive behavioral therapy teaches you to say, well, now, has the, have I ever felt this way before? Uh -huh. Was I having a heart attack then? No. no. And then that ratchets it down. They, right. they put it on a number scale. What are you feeling right now from right. 1 to 10? And that the self-talk brings it down. But if you have people that are on the autism spectrum that are having a hard time with theory of mind mm -hmm. and talking to yourself, that's going to be a harder thing to do. It doesn't mean that it doesn't work. It means it's going to take longer. Okay. And so my fear is with this article, and I specifically wanted to talk about this because it's a great, very you know, sentient article talking about how they've done some research and it looks like cognitive behavioral therapy is not as effective with people who are on the autism spectrum. And the higher the autism genetic risk score, the less the symptoms of depression decreased. Right. Um, but what that tells me, especially if you have a genetic disorder about autism, it means very likely you might be more impacted, right? And that ABA is probably not going to be as effective for you because mm -hmm. it's a more of a physical um, thing than a behavioral thing, right? But what we know about ABA is that it is effective with those kids. It just takes a lot longer mm -hmm. because the language piece isn't there. Right. And if the language piece isn't there... It's cognitive behavioral therapy. So we have to get the cognitive part of them understanding it first. I think it takes a very skilled practitioner uh -huh. who understands autism. But I have seen cognitive behavioral therapy work with individuals on the autism spectrum to help lower their anxiety. Okay. It just takes longer in somebody who knows what they're doing. Okay. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, yeah. We have a teacher strike going on. We we really do, and I know it's like it's, we, it's been a monsoon the last three days here I know. in Los Angeles. The weather's Angeles. been ridiculous. This torrential downpour. The streets are full of water. We're and just not used to getting this much rain. And on top of this, a lot of our kids are not in school, right. and our teachers are out on the streets being soaked, walking the picket oh, line. Right. right. And and you know when you delve into this to look at why they're picketing. Um, they are picketing for very specific things. Yes, it's uh, not just for about money. It's it about isn't. smaller classroom sizes. And, and having nurses on staff. Right. Uh, and I, I think it's super important that we support those teachers um, in the way that they would like to be supported. But I also want to put it out there, too, that, um, you know, f there are a lot of kids that are in special education right. who are without services. Who are without their aids. They're, they're saying uh, in US t uh, USA Today that it's 62,500 students. That's a lot of kids. Affected uh, with special needs, affected by the strike. And a lot of parents are, are continuing to send their kids to school and they have substitute teachers and there aren't aids. And, and I want to say that I think a lot of parents don't have a choice, that mm -hmm. that's the only place for their child yeah, they have to, to be. Work. And, if, and if that's what has to be, that's what has to be. But if you have the choice, I would encourage you, don't send your child to school. Have your child stay at home. Do Khan Academy. Khan mm -hmm. Academy, if your child is school age, even kindergarten, there are things that your child can do on the computer, um, even if they are, you know, a child that does not have a whole lot of receptive skills. There are things on Khan Academy that a kindergartner can do that will be helpful to them. Do not put your child at risk to be in a place where there are less supports. Right. Um, and and it will support your teachers and the, and the strike will end sooner if people can stay at home. If your child has to go to school uh, because you have no other choice, I would be communicating with your school officials to know what supports have they right. put in place for your know. child. 
um, so that you feel safe. But a lot of parents I know are like, mm, not crossing that picket line, right. not putting my, my child in a place where they do not have the supports mm -hmm. that they would normally have. Mm -hmm. I would look at other venues. If your child has an ABA provider, ask if your ABA provider will right. take them for more hours right. during the week. I know CARD has taken more kids uh -huh. in. Here at, here at CARD uh, headquarters, we have tons of kids that are here with their parents mm -hmm. while they're working, if your employer will let you do that. Um, but please check and make sure if your child is safe and and that you feel comfortable right. with the supports that they have put in place. But please know that the teachers are feeling it. They don't like leaving students. No, they don't. They at all. But they they're in. They're fighting for your kids in mm -hmm. the long term mm -hmm. because our kids should not be at school without a, a, a nurse. No. Okay. Um, the pro vaccine uh, the pro vaccine debate rages on um, anti-vaccine, pro-vaccine. And there's an interesting uh, situation here. There was a um, world-renowned pro-vaccine medical expert that had made comments that uh, vaccines are not necessarily safe for all children. Well, they, it, there certainly has... That's what I took away from this. Yeah. And they, they struck, they, they did not include his comments on that. It's a very interesting time that we live in right now. And uh, in The Hill, mm -hmm. which is not where I would expect to see this, mm -hmm. right? A publication that covers things that are happening on The Hill in Washington. Um, they allowed an article from Cheryl Atkinson that we've seen. She has been uh, doing a lot of investigative reporting and looking the at vaccine the vaccine issue. issue. That's a big thing for And her. a lot of people think of her as being somebody who's out there right. and on the edge. But the Trying Hill, to expose the truth. Right. And, uh, but a lot of, that may but, be. Yeah, but a lot of people are like, what truth to expose, right? You know, this is a very um, controversial subject. But in any case, The Hill allowed Cheryl Atkinson an article, an opinion piece that she put in with um, some different co quotes and talking about... RFK and some of the things that he has said and saying, you know, let's be reasonable here and let's, why, why is it that in every other venue of everything we're willing to do research and we're willing to look at, um, at what actually is happening. Uh -huh. Like it's not as if, even though we know that cigarettes can contribute towards cancer, they're still doing research on cigarettes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the fact is that they still are, even though we feel like that answer is, they're still doing research. And so why have we stopped doing research on um, whether vaccines are effective? And are there a subset of people that it affects? And do we need to look at that, right? So he's been advocating for that. And Cheryl Atkinson did an article uh, uh, and uh, it was published in The Hill mm -hmm. and said, this is something that needs to be looked at again. There's and it was already... specifically about Dr. Andrew Zimmerman, mm -hmm. who originally served as the expert medical witness for the government. Um, he has signed a bombshell sworn affidavit saying that during a group of 5,000 vaccine autism cases being heard in the vaccine court in 2007, he took aside the Department of Justice lawyers who worked for defending vaccine and told them he discovered exceptions in which vaccines could cause autism. For in a, he explained that a subset of children, vaccine-induced fever and immune stimulation did cause regressive brain disease with features of autism spectrum disorder. And, and the upshot of all this is that in response to this now, since this article came out, The Hill has um, featured uh, an, the opposite opinion, mm -hmm. um, saying this debate is over, the question has been answered, and it's written by a doctor who has a 16-year-old daughter on the autism spectrum. What is interesting to me is that in all this time, the, do the, the discussion has been about does, do vaccines cause autism? That's been, and, and the, the vast majority of the scientific uh, public stands very publicly and will say on camera, it does not cause autism. And we know that for sure. The thing that has always been concerning to me is that they don't go on to further address, can it be a contributory factor in some kids, in a subset of kids? And no one ever will answer that question. And what happened in this case was he was, he was fired as an expert witness, and they kept his opinion secret from other parents and the rest of the public. Yeah, and and you know all of these things need to be brought out. But my the thing that I am now most concerned about is that for the longest time nobody would go on record in saying 
they would not address, nobody mm -hmm. would answer the question, is it possible that a vaccine could contribute? And of course, uh, there's the Hannah Poling case mm -hmm. where in vaccine court, it was shown that it did contribute in her case. Right. And, and she had mitochondrial dysfunction? Yes. Right. There are so 16 mitochondrial other cases, they call them the 16 yellow canaries, mm -hmm. in which there is medical evidence that though that group of kids uh, that having a vaccine, there were elements of the vaccine that contributed, didn't cause, let's be very clear, mm -hmm. I don't want to get hate mail, did not cause, but contributed towards, uh, so for the longest time, there was no expert who would stand up and say, does not contribute. Right. But now in this new article in The Hill, this expert says exactly that. Right. I think that's something to be concerned about. Yeah. I think that, um, and, and he states in the article that's published in The Hill that he has a book and where to get his book, mm -hmm. which to me says you're trying to sell something. But I think... It, we need to be very careful about what people say and what they don't say right. and what we put out into the public. I know that there is a concern that we want to make sure that people that need to get vaccinated do get vaccinated. Um, but why on earth would we stop the conversation? Right. And why would we deliberately hide this comments from the public? And, and I do think that it's important that everybody, no matter which side you are on mm -hmm. about this, and it's not about picking sides. And I always say here that I... I am not anti-vaccine. Right. I am not at all. But I, I am pro-information. Yes. And I, and I, I do can't believe that, that a subset of children that they can contribute to it. Well, we based on the evidence. That well, we, we have. already know that. We know that. Which is right. why it worries me that we're publishing things now that negate that. Yeah. And if you're not sure on that, let me just say that whenever they do a push on television for vaccines and they have doctors that are on there and well-meaning doctors and they'll say please take your child and get your child vaccinated and one of the biggest reasons why we're asking you to take your child and be vaccinated is because there are some children who can't be vaccinated mm -hmm. there are some children whose immune systems are not well enough right. to be vaccinated and they will give the example of a child who has leukemia mm -hmm. and they'll say we can't vaccinate this child and this child needs you to vaccinate your child because he can't be covered and we need that herd mentality well, what you've admitted in that moment is that not all children have can an immune vaccinated. system that can be vaccinated so why are we pretending that it's something different right. let's look at who mm -hmm. can be and who can't be and stop getting emotional about it please don't send me any death threats i'm very <laughs> pro-vaccine <laughs> Okay, but let's be rational. Right. Let's be for our kids. Come on, come on, come on. Let's be, all be um, sentient here. Okay, uh, we got guests that are here. We got, yeah, we got two guests today. Yes, Carrie Fenster is here. He's been with us before. before right. I'm thrilled that he's going to be here. A musician, an musician, adventurer. Yeah. I love that. That's his title, musician, know, musician and adventurer. adventurer. What would you like your title to be? I don't know. That's <laughs> putting me on the spot. As an adventurer, I know. I don't know for myself, but I want to have a new. Would I be want a, great a new title. Way. Yeah, I'd like that. Uh, life tomorrow. adventurer. Right. Let's let's change our titles. Uh, but so he is here, and then we have another guest a coming mom. up. mom. That I'm so thrilled that we're going to be talking with all of these guests. Yes. Yeah, so that it circles for the community for kids, which we love. Right. Absolutely love. Okay. So all of this and more after these messages. Stick we'll be with back. Us. Do you provide care services to someone with autism? Recently, more and more children are being diagnosed with the condition and getting the support they need as awareness grows. But what happens to these children as they grow up? It's estimated that over half a million youth with autism will turn 18 in the next decade, and they'll be faced with a very difficult reality. As children with autism grow up, their services start to disappear or become very difficult to access. Things like medical care, mental health counseling, vocational training, and more. All services that are still desperately needed. The loss of support that youth with autism face as they grow up is so severe that it's referred to in the autism community as falling off a cliff. Adults with autism need the same level of support they had as children to avoid falling off the services cliff. Introducing Skills Living the web-based software designed specifically to help transitioning youth and adults with autism so they can avoid the cliff and instead fly to success. With Skills Living, help your learner with autism develop the skills they need in all the critical areas of adult life, including self-control, planning, and problem solving, effective communication, performing life skill tasks for independent living, acquiring and maintaining employment or other meaningful activities, developing and maintaining social skills and relationships, accessing transportation and public services, and being safe. 
Skills Living includes a comprehensive assessment, a data collection mobile app, behavior intervention plan builder, and automatic progress reporting. It also provides a complete curriculum addressing 16 key areas spanning the entire range of functioning adulthood. Skills Living is easy to use and can be implemented by schools, parents, and autism service providers. Call or click today for your free demo and see how Skills Living can help your learner with autism avoid the cliff and instead reach their fullest potential. Skills Living. Wish. Learn. Become. Lisa Ackerman, welcome back to Talk of Facts. Um, I, we hear questions all the time and we want to give you the answers that help make your journey in autism easier and more navigatable. Less than a year ago, we interviewed the top 100 doctors in the United States working with children on the spectrum and we asked them a question in the cloak of secrecy. What are the top three mistakes parents living with autism do? Number one, and my, the one that makes me laugh the most is when they use their physician as a marriage and family therapist. <laughs> one, the doctors told me it made them uncomfortable, and two, they were highly unqualified to provide that type of advice. So the night before your physician appointment with your MAPS doctor, get together with your spouse, significant other, and write out the list of the targets and the agenda that you wanna cover at the physician's appointment. Get in sync then you'll be definitely spending less time and not making that doctor so uncomfortable. Second thing that was the most common mistakes parents living with autism make is they wanna go too fast. And really, you wanna pace yourself in the autism journey. We all know that we wanna get our kid to be the best they can be and hopefully recover from autism. And what a lot of the doctors have told me is that you wanna really pace yourself, one, to let the labs be your guide and to work with your physician on the prioritization and the, the delivery of the different medical interventions. The third most common mistake they felt families made was giving up too soon. And what you need to know is they're invested, um, they're looking at wanting to get the best from your child. But I tell you that when I got that and consolidated the 100 interviews with these physicians, most of the doctors who brought that up had tears in their eyes. Um, they want you to know that they're in the fight with you and they want you to know that hope is really real. It may take hard work and it may take time, but to not give up and to stay in the game. So let Taka help you. We'll have some more Taka facts for you in the future, real questions and real answers for the autism journey. Mm -hmm. Neurodiversity in parents. One big happy family? We hope so. Anyway, what is neurodiversity? Everybody's talking a lot about it these days. Neurodiversity means that there's a view that people with autism just have a different way of being and they should be honored for that. And then parents oftentimes look at autism as a disability or a disorder and that can create some conflict. We sometimes throw up our hands, neurodiversity or neurodiversity. There can actually be some issues around this that we need to think about together. First of all, neurodiversity could be positive because it can create more of a kind of a sense of acceptance in society. Yes, these people have autism, they're just different. It could possibly help create a sense of self-esteem that's improved in people with autism. They just realize, okay, I'm not damaged, I'm not bad, whatever, I'm just different. So that could be useful. Um, on the downside, it could be an excuse to not give services to people with autism, to not have much empathy for their parents, and to not look at ways that they can be helped. And many people that have autism, they do very well. Other people do not do well at all. They can't access services. They cannot enjoy their life. They're in pain. So it is important that we understand it's not just one issue. So how do we solve this when we look at neurodiversity? I think we have to look at it this way. It's kind of like when you have that big family dinner at Thanksgiving and everybody's around the table, you got your uncle, your aunt, your kids, your parents, 
Everyone has an opinion. It doesn't necessarily mesh. And I think the way that we need to think about this is we need to respect each other's opinions because actually we need each other. We need to be allies on this. The outside world is a big place for people with autism spectrum disorders and their families. We have to remember we're one big, happy, dysfunctional family and we need to behave that way. We should respect each other, listen to each other, and we will all have a great time when it comes time to get together and celebrate the lives of people with autism. You say howdy, we say hi. Let's get rowdy, let's get wild. Let's get, let's get, 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 let's get wild. Welcome back. You're uh, live on Autism Life, and I've got my friend Jennifer here. I'm so excited she's here to help me. She's got a son named Dylan, I got a son named Jeff. We got all sorts of allergy issues. And a lot of you say, what the heck can we do to eat breakfast that's not full of carbs? And getting my son to eat vegetables. Oh, yeah. This is a vegetable. So we're gonna eat vegetables today. And right. so what we're making is a zucchini muffin. So let's go ahead and get started. So we just dumped in our zucchinis. Uh, you can start with less. You wanna graduate your kid to actually eating healthy. Um, we're gonna do some eggs. And again, I use the organic cage-free eggs. So there's our eggs. I'm going to add in our oil. Again, I use a high heat oil. And the reason why I use a high heat oil, because when you bake, you want to make sure you're using an oil that doesn't disintegrate. Because when oil gets too hot and it's not meant to get hot, it becomes toxic. So you got to be careful with your oils. So there goes our maple syrup. And again, organic maple syrup. What we're going to add next is cinnamon and our baking soda, baking powder to our mix. There's a lot of variations on flowers. A lot of our kids are, are allergic to wheat, so there's a lot of things we can do to make this SCD specific carbohydrate uh, compliant or just gluten-free, casein-free, soy-free. Um, and flaxseed meal. Flaxseed meal is a great resource for extra fiber within the kids' diets. We're just gonna turn on this fabulous, wonderful KitchenAid, and we're good. It's a great, great looking batter. And what we're gonna do is talk a little bit about baking, where almost everything is aluminum, and aluminum can be a problem for some kids, especially kids that can't methylate and take the toxins out with their body. But if you've got, like me, I've got muffin tins, so I have the ability to just simply put in some cupcake um, holders, and that actually holds that together if I wanna freeze great. it. Hey, nice work. Those look right. good, but wait till you see them when they're done. All right. So I'll go ahead and pull them out. Here are the fabulous muffins. Now, I, if you've got a sensory kid that doesn't like vegetables, I can already ice by the zucchini. Remember what I told you earlier. Resolve that simply by peeling off the green layer and then it will cook literally translucent. Such a nice golden brown. I love how the texture is. We know that the breakfast can be a challenge. This makes that process a whole lot easier for you and your family. Um, I really appreciate all the feedback. We definitely wanna hear from you for our next segment. If you'd like us to cook something or, or maybe make an old favorite and that's allergy free, we can do that here um, on Autism Live. So give us your feedback. You can email us at autismlive at gmail.com. We also have a Facebook page like everybody facebook.com slash autism live and also you can reach taka on the taka website at taka now we'll see you again soon thanks for joining us on autism live Welcome yeah, we're back. back. Yeah, we're just so you have some questions. I have some quick questions, and then we've got great guests here. In and of course, my iPad just died. But we had two questions that came in that I wanted to deal with. Um, somebody Pearl wrote in and said, "Was is there any golden rule for generalization?" And as a matter of fact, there is. It's plan from the beginning. So when you went, when you go to do a lesson. Um, to work with an individual on the spectrum, make sure that how you want it to be generalized is planned from the very beginning. By the way, that's a hallmark of good ABA. Uh, ask them, how are we planning for generalization from the beginning? And Brianna on Facebook wants to know, where can adults on the spectrum find group therapies and support groups in order to connect with others on the spectrum and to share experience and advice? The best place I can send you is www.wrong.com planet.net. 
It is an entire website that is curated and kept by the fabulous Alex Plank, a member of the autism spectrum, who, by the way, you're going to see in just, I think, two weeks on The Good Doctor. He's playing yeah, a he's big playing role oh, on, really the good, good. on The Good Doctor. But he created that website when he was 17, and there are more people on the spectrum talking about more support groups. Great there way are to teens connect. and adults. Wrongplanet.net. Don't go .org, .com, wrongplanet.net. You'll you'll love it. It's an amazing site. And by the way, parents go there to find out all the things that you want about adulthood. Such a great resource. Right. Okay, okay, thank so you. Okay, so now now we can introduce our two guests. First of all, we have Carrie Finster. Hi, Carrie. You've been on the show before. Musician and adventurer. We were saying we love his title. And we have Richie Gallo, his manager, and who is head president of Music School Records. Right. And, and yes. Yes. Is there anything that Music School Records specializes in? Well, not really. You know, Kerry was really the first artist. Uh, we signed him, what, two and a half years ago? Yeah. It's really, you know, it, it was a labor of love for me. I was in the music is industry for a long time, so this was sort of a give back. Mm -hmm. You know, he wrote these wonderful songs for these kids, and um, I had nothing to do at the time, so I made a record. Okay. <laughs> and here we are. And was that the Songs About Us? Yes. Okay, tell us about Songs About Us. The Songs About Us came together uh, as I moved to LA and I was t teaching and doing guitar lessons and I started working with some kids uh, that uh, with autism and different um, developmental disabilities and things like that and and just in general just talking to people I just like to talk to people and get to know people I'm just very fascinated with you know humanity and people and we these themes came up like social skills themes and mm -hmm. things about how to sort of how to be a good person stuff like that of all ages I had students that were teenagers in their 20s mm -hmm. and certain things kept coming up like having like how to have quiet hands when you're upset or mm -hmm. how to advocate for your own personal space and these terms quiet hands personal space they just sounded like song titles to me mm -hmm. and they're great concepts that were so recurring that it wasn't like these isolated things it was recurring with students that from all different demographics and walks of life so I was like there's something to this and so I just was completely inspired by my uh, by my people by my uh, students and I, I wrote these songs to sort of incorporate fun music like rock and roll and pop and ska mm -hmm. like not all educational or children's music has to be for infants mm -hmm. right not that there's anything wrong with that kind of music mm -hmm. <laughs> but there's like 25 year olds that you know don't want to listen to that kind of music but right. they still appreciate the educational component yes so that was the idea was to marry rock and roll pop you know music that's really for all ages with these kind of um, educational concepts right and like yeah. you said you have things like keep calm and use quiet hands yeah. keep calm and put carry on <laughs> yeah um, yeah, someone made that. That was pretty cool. I yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. And we're going to make you play in a second. Sure. Yeah. But you have just completed a whirlwind tour yeah. uh, uh, doing a lot of very special events. Talk to us a little bit about where you've been, what you've been doing. Sure. Uh, so in the spring of last year, um, the L.A. County Library started this uh, All Abilities series, mm -hmm. which was a, a whole thing kind of promoting and praising neurodiversity, all abilities, you know, inclusion, all these kinds of great things. So they heard of the record and they reached out to us and they invited me to do this like LA County library tour, which, you know, uh, LA County is huge <laughs> and there's yeah. so many libraries. So I did like 22 shows last year. I did like a, a batch in the sp uh, spring semester and then the batch in the fall semester, which just wrapped up in December. Mm -hmm. And I played at LA County libraries like all over and it was amazing. The turnouts were great and, uh, it was just so fun, and uh, I love I love libraries in general, and it was so fun, such a great audience. And I was yeah. saying during the break before we started that I, you know, if you haven't looked already, look at your local library and see what they have culturally, because it was great for us. We didn't always have money to be able to afford to do other things, right. but we would go every Wednesday. They would have a program at the library, and it'd be storytellers and performers like yourself, magicians. <laughs> I mean, we loved it, and yep. we were regulars at the library. We would go, and sometimes we took a therapist with us, mm -hmm. yep. and sometimes there'd be a craft that they would do. It's a great thing to do. Check right. out your local library. Maybe you're going to see somebody like Carrie perform. That's you right. It looks awesome. like their plans are maybe doing this again. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, I'll be playing today at the San Fernando Library. This there afternoon you go. at like 4 okay. o'clock. And then I think right. there's going to be more coming in the year. All right. Well, if you can catch Carrie today, please do so. Yeah. yeah. So all of you who are home from school because of the strike, now That's you got right. something to do later <laughs> on right. today. 4 o'clock, San Fernando. Travel through the rain. Be careful. And That's you right. also played at uh, Special Olympics. The mm -hmm. Yes. You had the honor of playing at the Special Olympics in Seattle this last July. And an honor it was. Oh, my God. I, you don't realize how 
Pseudo, big they are. Mm -hmm. They're it's huge. It's every it's like a name that everyone knows. You know, even if you're not in the community at all, mm -hmm. everyone knows Special Olympics. So it's just like, oh my God. And also it was cool because 2018 was the 50th anniversary oh. of the Special Olympics. So that's always like a it's kind of a special milestone, 50 years. So uh, yeah, they had me play at the local, uh, the regional games at Long Beach State in mm -hmm. June, and then in July they had me go up to Seattle and play at the uh, the national games, which were like right. the big ones. And that was just it was amazing. It was huge. I mean, yeah. it was the amount of people there and the amount of just like support and people involved. And I got to see Nancy Wilson from Heart sing the national oh, anthem. Oh wow, that's cool. Impressive. Well, yeah. So that was a huge honor. That was really fun. Okay, so I want to. Uh, we want to have you play something. Yeah, sure. sure. Uh, let's sell. Let's sell some CDs here. Where yeah. Where can people go to get the CD? You can get the CD everywhere music is found. Uh, iTunes, Amazon, uh, Google Play, uh, everywhere. You know, it's streaming on Pandora and Spotify. Okay. You know, all that stuff. So to get the record, yeah, it's everywhere music is found. Okay. And, uh, and it's great when you get the CD. I mean, you can always do the digital download, but when you get the CD, it's got the um, like the lyrics printed in and stuff like that, Love and it. some pictures. So. Love it. And yeah. you can sign it. And I can sign it as well. Oh, All okay. right, there we go. So yeah. you want to grab your guitar? Sure. And, and are there, is there a second CD in the works? Second CD is in the works. I think we're working on maybe a single. Yeah, for the time being, we do a version of All Together Now, the Beatles song right. from Yellow oh. Submarine. Yeah. And that is like one of, it's not an original, but it's one of the songs that really gets the crowd going. Right. Okay. Gets a lot of the kids dancing. It's a... It's one of those fun kind of songs or mm -hmm. whatever. So yeah. mm -hmm. it's interactive. We, yeah, so Love we've been it. thinking of recording that as a That's single it. and maybe put that out. That'd be great. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. All right. What are you gonna play for us? All right. Well, um, well, I was gonna do a, a newish song. Okay. Uh, this one's about taking turns. Okay. It's called Taking Turns. <laughs> aptly titled. All right. Um, so this one is not on songs about us, but it will be on the uh, forthcoming batch. Okay. It's great. one of the new ones. It's about about taking turns, and no one likes no one likes to wait, but it's something we all have to do, and it's nice because what what you want is coming. Okay. So that's what this one's called. Taking turns, taking turns. You've got to learn to wait your turn. I know waiting burns, oh, waiting burns. But we've got to learn. To wait our turn. There are many times we all have to wait. Stop signs, red lights, traffic. No one likes to wait, but it's okay to be late. Taking turns, oh, taking turns. We've all got to learn to wait our turn I know waiting burns 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 waiting burns 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 but we've got to learn to wait our turn psh, psh. there is plenty of sun there's no need to whine you'll get yours and I Taking turns, oh, taking turns. You've got to learn, learn, learn to wait your turn. You've got to learn, learn, learn to wait your turn. You've got to learn to wait your turn. My big question, yes. uh, besides, say where we can get the CD again. Sure. Oh, it, um, iTunes, uh, Amazon. And the uh, name of it? Google Play. The album is called Songs About Us. And everybody needs to get this and play it in your car when you're going yeah. back and forth right. to therapy. Right. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's a thing playing in the background. You'll find yourself doing it while you're doing the dishes. That's right. But your kid <laughs> will, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And these concepts are concepts that they need to get in their brain language. That's so right. So get, get this CD. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but have you shopped yet to uh, Sesame Street? Because Sesame Street people need you. We've tried numerous times, but... Sesame Street really is uh, in-house. Mm -hmm. All the music is done by 
the writers and the performers there. Yeah. So I've tried a couple of times. Um, All right, Sesame Street people, uh, and you know we know you. Um, be watching because like this is incredible. Thank you. Great Thank social you. Thank you so skills. Much tips and you incorporate this at all the songs so take away for kids yeah pretty much i mean sometimes i do covers and fun uh -huh. stuff like all together now by the beatles is a fun song it's not specifically pointing at a social skill but right. it's but it still has like a positive tip it's about being together and <clears throat> okay. singing together and things like that so um if it's not necessarily specifically educational it's at least fun and just praising how much fun music is and how it brings people together and you know try to keep things positive and Incorporate things. I also studied a little bit of music therapy at Cal State Northridge, and uh -huh. I, I, I learned a lot about how music is not just entertaining, but it's a carrier of information. Mm -hmm. So you could be listening to something that's you're on a conscious level just enjoying the entertainment value, but you right. don't even realize that subconsciously you're getting you're something. getting something in there. So a lesson. That's right. right. Absolutely. And yeah. You know, with Sesame Street, you know, the big thing now is they've got a diverse right. character. A character they've, with autism. They've introduced yeah. had Julia on the show. Yeah, yeah they've actually oh, wow. introduced somebody the to the show. show. Wow. But yeah. Yes. That's cool. Um, uh, yeah. it's, 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 you know, it's, it's just... It's a no-brainer. It's, yeah, it it's it a really no-brainer, but it's kind of a dead end, I mean, just in the sense that, you know, they're they're all in-house. It's all... We got you, Richie. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's all good. Um, but love this. Thank you, Go Shannon and, and, and you have a website where people can follow you? Yeah, CarrieFenster.com, uh, Carrie Fenster Music on Facebook. We have a lot of Carries on this show, so we have to spell the Carrie because they're all spelled differently. Right. K E. R R Y. Okay. Like okay. the county in Ireland. Right. All right. Yeah. Uh, I get into all kinds of trouble with all the carries on the show. So <laughs> yeah. Carrie Fenster, F E N S T E R yep. dot com. That's it. Uh, and get this C D. You won't be sorry. Not at all. And it's, and it's good music. Yeah. And it's good music. That's um, the whole but idea. But it's got that thing that you'll you'll find and yourself doing away. the dishes, yes, saying taking turns and That's it. You know, mm -hmm. and better that than some of the other things that exactly. you can have running through your head. True that. But play it in the car. That's right. Uh, every moment is a le learning opportunity. We say this to you all the time. That's right. This great way to have it be entertaining. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank so you much. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. My pleasure. Yes, you guys are awesome. Have you here. Thank yeah. you so, so much. And we'll be looking on the website for what you've got coming up yeah, in terms on the of website. appearance. And also, yeah, on uh, Carrie Fenster Music on Facebook and also just Carrie Fenster on Twitter, Instagram, pretty much okay. my name across social media. And great. when you've got yeah. the second CD, come back. Yes, we will. Do. Okay, play some songs from it. We're going to take you. a break and come back with Islet Sasson. I'm, yes. I'm sure I slaughtered I, her. No, name. I think you did it correctly. <laughs> I will be back at the Magellan Community again. Circles. All right, bye bye. Okay. Nobody ever asks a kid with autism, "What is it you really like to do?" At this school, we ask the kids, "What is your goal? What is your dream?" Exceptional Minds is a vocational training program for young adults on the autism spectrum who want to have careers in computer animation and visual effects. I think young people with autism are totally underestimated. When you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. They all have different talents, different skills, and what surprised me is that there really are no limits. That if these guys believe that they can do something, they really can. It's estimated that 90 to 95 percent of young adults with autism are unemployed or underemployed. A lot of young adults still live at home. A lot of them suffer from depression and are very isolated from the rest of the world. And the opportunities for them are very limited. We want to develop careers for our young adults. Our full-time program runs three years, at the end of which we have job placement and job coaching. We have a work readiness program. We also have our own in-house studios so that when our students graduate, they can do on-the-job training and work on real projects. We outsourced about 30, 40 shots to the team here. They did fantastic work that we can put into a movie and be proud of it. It's great. I mean, we want to do it again. The studio is their first step into the professional world, the first step in their new careers as digital artists. The whole purpose is to get the students out into the real world. We all have the same dreams. We want significance, dignity, and purpose with our lives. We have an opportunity to give those three words to every single student at this school 
who will actually be able to go out and participate in the dream. This is my first full-time, full-paying job. I primarily work in After Effects. I learned After Effects at Exceptional Minds. It seemed like a good place for me to fit in because I was interested in animation. Right from the first day that Nikki set foot in our company, he was producing work for us. We saw what level of professionalism is being instilled in them from the very beginning. This was the first opportunity where Nikki could combine something he loved to do with something he was really, really good at that could eventually lead to employment. When we first met Kevin, he was working in a supermarket bagging groceries, and they said he would never amount to anything else. I work at Stargate Studios, and uh, I'm a junior compositor. I mainly do like rotoscoping right now, and I'm still learning. I think that you find great talent in the most amazing places. The students at Exceptional Minds have had a fair amount of training to get them ready for the visual effects environment. If it wasn't for Exceptional Minds, I might still be at the supermarket and I might be living at my parents' house. Everything's changed. Nikki has purpose. It feels like I'm a member of society now. He's capable of making it on his own. Once you get inside and you see what's really happening there, you immediately want to be a part of it. It's the dream factory, you know, the, the movie business. And, and if you can connect people with their dreams, then the magic happens. At Exceptional Minds, we like to say that we are changing lives one frame at a time. Welcome back. Yes, so excited. Yes, We're Yellen, here yes. with Ayelet mm -hmm. Sasson. Mm -hmm. So I did slaughter her name before. Beautiful name, mm -hmm. beautiful name. And the two of you knew each other. Do you want an yes. intro? I'm, we I know each in. other. That's okay. We know each other from swimming right. class. Mm -hmm. Our kids are, were involved with that at uh, Agora mm -hmm. High School. And you have come up. You're president of a wonderful organization called Magellan. Magalim. Magalim. Magalim okay. Community Magalim Circles. Magalim Community Circles. Tell right. us what Magalim Community Circles so is. So Magalim is circles in Hebrew, but it's not necessarily just for Hebrew speakers. Okay. And Community Circles, we just, we wanted to create one big circle with all Hebrew, not Hebrew, together as one with the community. Okay, and this was inspired by your son. My older son, I have four kids. My mm -hmm. older son, Yarin, is almost 23. Okay. And he, is, he has autism. And you were looking for things for him to do? Correct, yeah. We okay. got to a point that uh, there's nothing out there waiting for us. Right. And we need something to do. And I went to see a few day programs that I felt that are not necessarily challenging enough. Mm -hmm. So... Um, we wanted to create more programs, more social activities for him to enjoy with more friends. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think it's always remarkable when a parent um, is so proactive, when you see the need and feel the need. Uh, so as you've started these programs, what difference have you seen for your child and for a uh, child? He's an adult. He's, he's an 23. Adult. Yeah, we Excuse forget that they're growing up. For your young man. Yes, uh, he's, he's a big, he's 6'1", and yeah, he's a big yeah, man. He's a big, so yeah, he's a big guy. What, ha what differences have you seen? Have you started this program for him and for the other people in the right. program? So uh, a lot of things that I see is not just for the young adults that are more happy to see each other because they have more opportunities to meet. We see also the parents have the chance to just laugh, talk, and have fun because when the kids, young adults, are busy, we just have an hour to ourselves. Yeah. So it's amazing. It's an hour and a half, an hour and a half. It depends on the event. But, ex but we do um, events like once a month, mm -hmm. social events. But regardless to that, we open classes. So we have a volleyball team that uh, meet once in two weeks. We have an art program once a week. We are opening now a choir. We are trying to make them busy, and it brings a lot of joy, yeah. really happiness, joy. What makes it so wonderful is that it's not just for them. We bring typical kids in their age, mm -hmm. and they are participating as 
everyone else in the program. So I want to call them volunteers, but they know that they are part of the program. They're like buddies. They are like buddies. And we teach them not to see any wall between them, just to take down everything that scares you. Come, do whatever you can. Just ask, how was your day? You know, yes. those little basic stuff that teens doesn't think that it's so important but for us parents that doesn't have friends for our kids it's very very important what tell us about some of the experiences that you've created so um i got a call from a mom that met one of the teenager that came to volunteer in the event and she asked me if she can contact him personally and they took it from there they meet they go to movies they do whatever they wanted to in their spare time so that Magalim just created the bond or the get to know each other. And whatever you take it from here, it's yours. Whatever we can help, we are here for that. Um, I got to know many parents that are amazing, 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 and just enjoy the journey with us. Mm -hmm. It's all volunteers. This Magalim is mm -hmm. all volunteer. Mm -hmm. We approach businesses, we tell them we yeah. are here. We want you to give back to the community. So I want to give you an example. Next, um, on the 27, we have a fitness club that mm -hmm. just approached us because he knows us. And he said, you know what? I will open the gym for you. My coaches will be here to train the kids. I have 12 uh, spots available in the gym according to my place and just come. What a this is our thing. next event. Mm -hmm. So I love this whole metaphor of the circle because in truth, what we see that what happens in society is when people don't have a circle, yeah. that's when bad stuff happens. People feel disconnected. They don't feel like they have a community. And, and in making this circle, the things that you've created, not only for the individuals that you, you were seeking to help and keep busy, as you were saying when you first started, but for those volunteers, right. it's added for them and made their circle Absolutely. bigger. And it's helped you to have a circle of parents um, who feel that they have a community. That's such a it's service. It's a win-win situation. Yeah. It's a win-win. I approached by Facebook to the community. I said, okay, we are done with high school. What am I doing now? Right. Because I was terrified. I saw a day, day program that just took the kids from the mall to the park, to the park, to the mall. And I right. said, no, Yarin can do better than that. Mm -hmm. So I just put an ad on Facebook. And I said, I am looking for Yarin to be busy. Who can offer me help? I love mm -hmm. it. So a nice kosher pizza place mm -hmm. texted me back. She said, you know what? What can he do? I said, I don't know. He right. never worked. Let's try. So we just jumped to the pool with the deep water and took it from there. And now, after this show, I will show you guys a video that I was amazed that he's folding boxes of the pizza, the trays. In an hour, he creates like, I want to say 50. It's crazy. He works so fast. Yeah. He doesn't text. He doesn't talk to anyone. He comes to do his work. Mm -hmm. An hour, he clocks in, he clocks out, he gets paid. And he's doing that on a regular he gets basis? He paid three times a week. And I'll three bet they love week. him. They love him. What a wonderful thing. Yeah, so three times a week he goes to the pizza place, Brahmi's, he's folding, he's going back happy, he has right. an ATM, he deposits a check. Mm -hmm. We want him to feel that he's doing something. Right, sense yes. of accomplishment. Yeah. Good for him to feel that. So for this circle that you have created, can it take more people? Can people Everyone come? Everyone is to welcome. It? So, how would they find? Yeah. find Magalim it? Community Circles. We have Facebook. Okay. We have website. What's your website? Magalimcircles.org. M A A M A L I M Circles.org. So two A's. Two A's. M A A. Two A's. G A L I M. Correct. Wonderful. And um, so uh, great. And then for people who are watching, they're like, I'm not in the LA area. Um, what can they do? How could somebody start this themselves in Just their area? Just reach out to us and do copy whatever we have now in your area. More than welcome. We are here to help. Okay. This is not a business. This is making people more happy to create that. Okay. Well, I, I always, I, you know, we have a thing here. We talk about the power of one. Yeah. And when one person, so often what we see is that one person looks at the world and goes, where's, I want to arrive. I want to come and arrive and have the thing already there. I do too. 
We all do. Yeah. But often we find in autism we arrive and it's not there. Mm -hmm. And and then I what I love is a spirit like yours where you go, well then I don't even know how to create it, but I'm gonna. And, and putting or an a, thing on Facebook and we saying, I need something for my kid to do and, and to just jump. Yeah. And I can see it on your face that it's been <laughs> rewarding for you. It is, it is, it's amazing. We, after each event, we get those texts and emails from mm -hmm. parents mm -hmm. uh, telling us that they're so happy and they see their kid. You know, in the events, sometimes I see people with wheelchairs, not right. just autism. Right. Everyone is welcome, by the way. It's All not just needs. autism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can be as special as you think you are, high function, low function, whatever. We are, we are there to help and we will appear somebody that can, you know, accommodate your needs. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing because in the parties, the dancing parties, we have like the wheelchairs mm -hmm. and the special needs dances with them. With the right, wheel. right. What can be more powerful than right, this? That's wonderful. It's amazing. Amazing, right. amazing, really. Right, we well. have uh, the, the, the Valentine is coming up, so we are working on that. We have a lot of events just to follow us and get and just come. If you want to volunteer, volunteer. If you want to donate something, come and tell us. We will give it back. If a you lot. have a business that wants yeah, to sponsor, yeah. having somebody come work or, you know, Everyone like coming to the welcome. gym, Everyone. it's all good. Now we are trying to put together a choir because we did that in the, we had a gala on uh, May mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was amazing. The kids were singing, this is my fight song. Uh, I was crying. Yeah. No, no, I, I, we have one singer. She has autism. Uh -huh. She lives in the city. Uh -huh. And she used to come to practice with us every Sunday, and her voice, like, and the kids behind her with the special needs was drumming with her. Mm -hmm. So we want to take that and start a and choir. Start a choir slash instrument. Right. Love so it. We are now reaching out to people that wants to help us just to form it together to, to something unique. Right. And to, to make them shine. Yeah. yeah. What a wonderful thing. Yeah. Okay, well, well, unfortunately, we we're out of time. Parents, yeah, we encourage parents to get in touch with you. Yes. And if they want to be a part of this wonderful circle, if they have oh, ideas for activities for the circle, please contact yeah, I Violet. Think, I want to add just a yeah. little thing. Um, for my journey, it's mm -hmm. beautiful to see that I have a partner that not at all a special need mom. Mm -hmm. She just joined the ride to help us, and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Rachel Weitzman, amazing. Okay, what a that's wonderful great. thing. Well, we salute her, too, yeah. because, you know, that's what we need more of in this world. Yeah. Uh, what a fabulous, thank you. fabulous thing. Thank you for thing. inviting us. Thank You're you welcome. so much. Uh, all right, you guys, unfortunately, we're out, we're out of time. Of time. Uh, we will be back tomorrow with a live show tomorrow. We've got all kinds of things going on tomorrow. Special guest, Crystal Fontaine, our autism expert, will be answering your questions. You can be writing in now for mm -hmm. that tomorrow. Uh, also, Bonnie Yates is going to be with us, special education Bonnie Yates, talking about what your rights are in the strike, um, what is available to you during the strike, things that you can be doing. There is apparently a strike uh, what oh, a special manifesto. needs manifesto, <laughs> what you are entitled to okay, during a strike to, so that you can know your rights. And then we've got another great guest who's going to talk to us about solving what happens when we're not here. I know that makes us oh, all know. anxious, us all right? Anxious. Um, but a new service here in Los Angeles helping families to plan for the inevitable future mm -hmm. when you're not working anymore and when you're not here anymore, making sure you're taking care of your kids. So all of that's happening tomorrow plus some autism in the classroom and our mindfulness moment that's okay. happening tomorrow. Very busy Un show. Yes. Until then, uh, give your, well, give, you know, uh, goodbye. And goodbye. give your kids, kiddos a hug from me. And yourselves a hug from me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.